Listen, we've been in, uh, we started a series last week entitled, What Would You Do? It's going to be kind of a long series, and we're kind of setting up some, some foundational pieces. Uh, last week, we talked about how we're living in a postmodern culture, which, which pretty much just means uh, we're living in a relativism culture, where there's, we, we live in a culture where they want to say there's no such thing as absolute truth, and anytime there's absolute statements, they need to be deconstructed because they're a threat or they're oppressive or things of that sort. It's a very interesting time that we're living in. So we talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit leading us into all truth. Um, but today we're going we're gonna to still continue on the Holy Spirit. We're going to move in a little bit on the gifts of the Spirit because it's not just truth but power. We always see Jesus combined or walk and live with this combination of both truth and power. And I believe the same is necessary for the church today. So I, I want to speak to you today around this idea. And so let me, I'm setting the stage for both of these, for truth and power. And then we're going to ride on the gifts for a little bit. And then we're going to get into some of um, the truth portions of dealing with some of the, the situations in our day uh, that we're facing and, and dialoguing around some of those things. And so I, I want to speak to you a little bit around today of, of this idea of you are gifted. You are gifted. Would you pray with me, Father, in Jesus' name? Lord, I just pray that you'd help me to communicate your word in a, in a, clear, um, in a clear way, God, that I, I would speak your heart. God, help me to get out of the way, that you would have your perfect way. Um, and Holy Spirit, we want to exalt you today. And so I pray that uh, really trying to help everybody know you're not weird. And so just help me as I communicate in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird, but the Holy Spirit is not. So, so recently, um, this last week, I was in a pool for eight hours. Anybody ever been, everybody been in a pool for eight hours recently? So I'm preparing for diving with great whites. I go to dive with great whites in October. And so I've been doing all my diver training courses. And so I spent eight hours in a pool and it's kind of torturous because you have a lot of luggage on you. Um, and they make you do some very intense things, uh, like not breathing underwater, cutting off your air supply, and, and you have to learn how to function and navigate underwater. Can I just tell you, we were not made for that. We were not naturally designed to function underwater. And uh, it was such a fun experience. It was a long day. We got in the pool at 1130. I didn't get out of the pool till 730, literally consistent, no breaks, no bathroom, no drink, just pounded all the way through. And, uh, and there was this one part, this one part of the test that threw me off a little bit. I, I, I had a hard time reconciling this in my brain. Now, anytime you're underwater, the, the idea is to hold your breath. Well, in diving, that is the worst thing you can do. If you hold your breath and you're not breathing properly, or you're not exhaling, when you come up to the surface, if you do it wrong, you can blow up your lungs. So it's, it's not good. But, but one of the, the things that they, they had us do, they had us go underwater, and we did a lot of different things. They cut off our air supplies. They said, we want you to know how it feels like not to breathe underwater. It's like, okay, cool. Um, so we did that. They, they, you know, you pull out your mouthpiece, they throw off your goggles, and you have to get acclimated underwater, reset, get the water out of your, um, your little, your air thing. I, I should know what it's called. Uh, uh, so get your regulator, regulator regulator. It's going to be a fun trip. And, uh, and so just a lot of cool stuff, but there was this one moment he said, okay, this is going to be one of the most uncomfortable portions of the test. He says, you're going to take your air, your aerator and, and, or your regulator, and you're going to push the button on, on the back of it. Now what it does, if you push the button on the back, it spits all the, all the air out very rapidly. So if you try to breathe that, there's no way you can breathe that. So sometimes when you're diving underwater, that will get triggered and it'll just start spitting out air. Well, if it does that and you're 40 feet down, you're in some trouble because you can't suck in all that air. It's just way too much. So what you have to do is you have to put it on the side of your mouth and suck in the bubbles. So I was like, hold on a second. So I'm going to be underwater and you want me to suck the bubbles in. Oh, yeah, you'll breathe perfectly. What? So, so my, my partner goes... And, uh, and so she does it, and she has it not configured right. And so I just see her, like, shoot to the surface, right? I'm like, oh, gosh. 
So, so no joke, no joke. Put it on the side of my mouth, push that little button. All this air is coming out underwater and I can breathe perfectly, sucking in the bubbles. It, it was the most like exhilarating thing. And I kind of felt like a boss on the first round. I was like, yes. But, but I'm actually, you're, you're breathing the bubbles. My mouth is not on the regulator, just breathing in the bubbles. And it feels like you're breathing normally. Now, now, I say all that to say is that sometimes when we talk about the Holy Spirit operating in our lives, there is this uncomfortability. For some of us, it doesn't feel really natural. It feels very uncertain. But we soon realize that life with the Holy Spirit is a breath of fresh air to our soul and to the world. In fact, I'm not even like exaggerating. The, the word spirit, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, ruach in the Hebrew, pneuma in the Greek, has the same range of meaning as it likewise can refer to spirit, spirit, wind, or breath, or breath. And so, so we talked about last week how the Holy Spirit illuminates our heart, draws us in, reveals to us that we are in need of a Savior. The moment you and I confess Jesus as Lord, the Holy Spirit enters on the inside of us. You don't get junior varsity Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit. And like Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the day of redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. And so we see that the Holy Spirit not only draws us um, and, and reveals our need for a savior. But the moment we believe the message of the gospel, confess Christ as Lord, he enters into us, seals us into the day of redemption. And, and, and that's, it doesn't just stop there. He not only seals us, but he transforms us and he empowers us, transforms us more and more to the image of the savior and empowers us to live for him, testify about him. Life with the Holy Spirit is a breath of fresh air. Now, we talked a little bit about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, we're not going to fully get there today. We're going to get there later in the series when I talk about tongues. <laughs> some of you guys are so excited about that. Uh, some of you, others of you are like, that's why I left my last church. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> Promise you, no snakes, no swinging from chandeliers, nothing weird. Holy Spirit's not weird, but people are weird. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about baptism of the Holy Spirit. You... you uh, Many of, of you have, that have grown up in church, you might have heard of something like this. You get saved, boom, you get the Holy Spirit. But then there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, mainly referring to Acts chapter 2, outpouring of the Spirit's power. They begin to speak in other languages, known languages. People outside are hearing them speak in other tongues, known languages. We'll talk all about that later in the series. But, but I, I argued that it's not simply a second experience. But it's an ongoing experience, multiple experiences when we do life with the Holy Spirit. We see this all confirmed throughout the book of Acts and being filled with the Spirit. And they were filled with the Spirit. So it's not like there's, you know, we get saved and there's this outpouring, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, and then we're done. No, it's we get saved, we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then we have an outpouring of the Spirit's power in our lives, throughout our lives in these moments where we described or defined it as an outpouring of the Spirit's power in our life for Christ-exalting ministry, for edification of the body, and personal encouragement and sanctification. It's a lot of words. But, but it's, it's this, this reality of Paul talking about in Ephesians chapter 5 when he says, Do not be drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit. Remember we said last week that word filled is a continuum. It means be being filled. That it's an ongoing relationship and multiple outpouring of the Spirit's power in our life for Christ's exalting ministry, for edification of the body, and for personal encouragement and sanctification. And so, so Luke chapter 24, Jesus would describe it like this. He says, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. 
clothed with power, an outpouring of the Spirit's power in our life. Now, I argued the point that, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit debatable, but most scholars today believe that the disciples had the Holy Spirit predicated on John's gospel when Jesus breathed into them. And Acts chapter 2, because of the wording and the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, the wording that even Joel used is more of a prophetic power rather than salvation. Paul, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, talks about a baptism in regards to salvation, meaning we're filled with the Holy Spirit at salvation and we're baptized into one body by the Spirit. So we see this beautiful reality, regardless of how you try to piece it together, that at salvation we are filled with the Holy Spirit and then there's outpouring of the Spirit's power in our life for Christ's exalting ministry, for edification of the body, and for personal encouragement and sanctification. So you're going to hear me say that a lot. Um, and, and so, so an outpouring of the Spirit's power in our life. Now, what, what does that look like? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, many when they hear Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, they think reform sensationist, but that's not who he was. He was definitely reformed in his theology, but believed in an outpouring of the Spirit's power. This is how he described it. He said, a man and his little child are walking down the road and they're walking hand in hand. And the child knows that he is the, he is the child of his father And he knows that his father loves him. And he rejoices in that and he's happy in that. There's no uncertainty about it at all. But suddenly the father, moved by some impulse, takes a hold of the child and picks him up and embraces him in his arms and kisses him and embraces him and showers his love upon him. And then he puts him down again and they go on walking together. That is it. The child knew before that his father loved him and he knew that he was his child. But oh, the loving embrace, this extra outpouring of love, this unusual manifestation of it. This is the kind of thing, the spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And he goes on to say, he says, when Jesus baptizes somebody with the Holy Spirit or there's this moment of this outpouring of the Spirit's power in our life, he says, a person is carried not only away from their doubts to belief, but to certainty and a a deep abiding awareness of the presence and the glory of God. I know it's a mouthful. But it's just this, I, I just think it's such a beautiful picture of the Lord just embracing just, and we're just like, whoa. And sometimes we think of it as mysterious and spooky, and I just love how he frames it. And so the Spirit of God not only empowers us, but the Spirit of God gives us gifts. Now, the moment I say that, uh, if you grew up in a sensationist camp, a sensationist camp believes that the gifts of the Spirit cease with the apostles and the origination of the New Testament. Um, A lot of those guys are shifting today. Um, some of them, they've written thousands of books on it. So it's like, if I change that, uh, I got to go like back on everything. But in, in a lot of the dialogues, a lot of times this comes from the reform community, which I am deeply uh, invested in and connected to. And a lot of the guys that I know, even prominent figures have, have really kind of shifted on this to where, man, even in their services, man, they're laying hands on sick people. They're still trusting and relying on the sovereignty of God to move. Like no one's trying to fabricate anything but really moving to this reality that it's really hard to build an argument that all of this just stopped from the text. So they're not being moved by experience. They're not being moved by anything except for the text. But when I say gifts, a lot of us, we can get weird. Like I said, some of us are like, I left my last church because it was just weird. And then I came to this church and you guys seem kind of normal. Now it's like, great, you're weird too, right? No, no, I promise you. Listen, I I grew up in a church that was extremely Bible and Christ and gospel centered, and we still believed in the gifts of the Spirit, and we weren't weird. Um, And and that is who we are here. We are not a sensationist church. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but they're still in operation today. Um, And hopefully I'm going to help bring some clarity over the next several weeks to what this looks like and how God has actually gifted you. But when we talk about gifts, if you grew up like in a Baptist background, well, let me say this. If you grew up in a just non-church background, you don't even really have a a connection to gifts. You may think like you've seen some stuff on YouTube maybe. Maybe you've heard some things about these weird Christians, like I said, holding snakes. And any documentary on Netflix just blows it way out of like, That's not Christianity, and it's definitely not the Holy Spirit. Um, But if you grew up in a Baptist background, um, I I may let let me give you a a little bit of a picture. 
If I preach a great message, people laughed, people cried, a deep sense of the presence of God, people get saved. After the service, it's not uncommon for many of us pastors that somebody will come up, if they have more of a Baptist background or, or more of a Reformed background, they may say this, hey, great word, walk away, mic drop, right? Great word. And now if you have somebody that comes from more of a charismatic background, they may come up and say, oh, did you sense the presence of God? That was so anointed, right? And if you put those people in the same room, you would be hard pressed to have them agree that they're talking about the same service. And so we want to make sure that as a church, we, we have a great clarity um, when in language around the gifts of the Spirit that we understand so that we can know, so that we can grow in the gifts that God has given us, and so that our joy would be, uh, that there would be the joy that we get to experience as we honor God with the gifts that he's given us. As, and as we do our part in the body of Christ, knowing our part, knowing our purpose, there's something so special about that. Because when we're operating like that as a church, it carries into eternity and makes a huge impact. So let's just distinguish a couple of things. What's the difference between natural gifts, learned abilities, and spiritual gifts? Because sometimes we get these confused, right? Some things you were just born with. Like, like some of you guys, I look at you, you're, you were just born with an athletic physique. You know, I just didn't get that. I was telling Jackie the other day, I'm like, what's wrong with my spine? Like my neck just wants to shoot forward. Like, if you ever see me hunching, you have full permission to say, sit up straight, buddy. Stand up straight. Because it's uncomfortable. But some of you guys, just, there's just a natural just gifting. Right, my, my wife, she's naturally athletic. True story, if, you, if we're playing softball, you want her on your team. You don't want me on your team. I'm gonna look like I can play the part, but I can't. I can catch, I can hit a little bit, but you're gonna want her on your team. So, some of you guys just have that, those natural abilities. Those are still God-given in how he created you. So they're still God-given and how he created you. And then there's learned abilities. There's just skills that we've learned along the way that are giftings that we have or maybe we're inclined to, and, and we've just learned, we've progressed, we've, we've trained, and, and we've been equipped in a particular skill or area of, of sort. Still, God's grace on your life to be able to learn that, all of that. So it's still God-given. But sometimes we get natural abilities and learned abilities confused with spiritual gifts. Are, are, you, are you guys tracking with me on that? I like how Bobby Clinton said it. He was a, a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He said, natural abilities or talents are given by God through creation, while acquired skills can be learned by training, education, and experience. But spiritual gifts, I don't know who said this, but I, I like the wording of it, said that spiritual gifts are not natural talents, but they are divine, I spelt it wrong, diving. <laughs> See where my head is? I'm still in the water, eight hours. And, and a bunch of quizzes. Natural talent, but they're dive abilities. <laughs> Divine abilities that enable us to do ministry. Listen, you just heard it. You don't want perfection, God. If you want my heart, you got it. <laughs> God's like, I want your spelling too, bro. Obviously, spelling and grammar, you have learned if you've been in this church, is not a natural ability for me. It's not a natural talent. We have people that normally check my stuff. Um, so, so, so anyways, all, all, of, all of those things are God-given abilities. All of them are God-given. But, but spiritual gifts are, are a little bit different. And all those, even, even your talents and natural abilities and acquired abilities, those things and skills that you've learned can still be used for ministry, can still be used to glorify God. You know, what you're doing on your job. All of those are outlets. I'm just trying to bring a distinction between those things and spiritual gifts. We don't want to confuse the two. Now, now when I was, uh, I'll never forget, um, I was newly, I was walking with the Lord for maybe like one or two years. I went to a youth camp and I was praying for this kid. Never forget, he had freckles, little redhead kid. And I put my hands on him to pray for him. It was after a service one night and man, I just sensed the presence of God. And you got to understand, like, I, I would, I wanted, I'd love to go back, and if you could see me in this moment, I mean, I still probably look totally like a thug, like, just, just, just going for it, right? 
So I'm praying for this kid, and I just sense the Lord just giving me a word of knowledge. The difference between a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom, we'll talk about that later down the road. A word of knowledge normally gives information. Um, a word of wisdom gives direction. And so, so, so I, just, I just, man, God gave me this picture like, man, you're going to preach the gospel and all these things. And so I'm just, by faith, stepping out, really since this is what the Lord is saying. Um, I'm very careful with thus say it the Lord's. Um, so anytime I'm praying for somebody in that regard, I'll just say, hey, take it. The Bible says test the spirits. Don't nullify the spirit, but test the spirits and make sure it's from the Lord. Test it with scripture. Pray about it. If it resonates with you and you believe it's from the Lord, man, praise God. So I'm, I'm very rarely have ever said, thus say it the Lord. Like, I don't know if I've ever said that. Um, in, in a time of, of praying for somebody or if I feel like God gives me a word of knowledge, just always test it, pray about it. But in this moment, something interesting happens. So I'm, I'm praying for him, and all of a sudden, God gives me his name. Boom. Never met the kid in my life. He said his name is Matthew. And so I looked at him. I said, what is your name? He's crying. Matthew. I was like, what? <laughs> like, like, no joke. I stopped like, are you serious? Is that really your name? It's like, yeah, it's my name, Matthew. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, God, like, you're really using me in a way that was not normative, right? And it, and it wasn't any, anything weird. It was just simple. Like, you're going to preach the gospel. You're going to lead many to Jesus. It wasn't anything, like, major. Or like, it was just no. But, but it was like the Lord showing me. And I had experienced that personally when I, when I was wrestling with anxiety. Pivotal moments in my life have been God has met me through gifts of the Spirit. So I remember I was going through just a season of, of really bad anxiety. I struggled with it. I've struggled with anxiety my whole life. Um, the, it's kind of like the forest. Like even though I'm out of the forest, the bark is always to my back. And, but there was a season where it was really bad for about three years. Imagine no joy, no peace, just feeling like, God, what is it? I felt like I was losing my mind. I told my mom a couple times, like, hey, can you just take me to John George? Like, something is wrong with my head. And my mom's like, well, I, I knew that, but I didn't know <laughs> it was this bad. But I, I remember I, I it would get so bad, I would, I would get sick. I lost one of my jobs because I just couldn't function. I would read the Bible. Whenever the Bible talked about the wicked, I'd be like, that's me. Like, what? It was just bad. It was bad. But I kept showing up to church, kept serving in ministry, kept praying for peace and joy for other people. And, and God taught me a lot in that place of I walk by faith. I don't walk by my feelings. I don't walk by. So I learned so much of that season. So now if like, I don't feel God, that doesn't move me at all. I just, just keep going. Um, the moments where I feel and sense the presence of God, praise God. But I don't need that anymore to, to have affirmation that God is with me. Um, does that make sense? So God uses dark seasons. But, but I'll never forget, I was, I was in a small group, and I was just dying in my mind. Now, on the outside, you couldn't tell. Still fresh, <laughs> smile. Oh, it's good. I'm good. Good. Everything's good. But in my mind, I'm like, I'm dying. So I'm sitting in, in the small group, and, and it's a time of prayer. And I'll uh, never forget uh, Auntie Arlene. Uh, she, nobody knew what I was going through. I was very private. Didn't tell anybody except my mom. And maybe, I don't even know if I told anybody outside of my mom. And maybe a couple people. But, uh, but she had no idea. And so I'm sitting there, and it was like the worst day. I was at my job. I threw up maybe four or five times from anxiety. And... And so I get, I get to the small group, still showing up, no excuses, right? Show up to small group. And that's why we're so powerful because my life was transformed. That's why we're so passionate about small groups because my life was transformed in a small group. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and they, they start, you know, we start praying, and she comes over to me, and she puts her hand on my head. And she said, young man, you're having a horrible battle in your mind. How many of you guys know at that point I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> And she said, they're, they're all lies from the enemy. But the Lord says there's a season of joy on the horizon. Amen. My anxiety did not go away that day. And matter of fact, it, it probably didn't really lift for about another year. But what I knew in that moment is that, God, you know me. You haven't forgot about me. Because in that place, you can feel like, God, are you there? Like, I'm crying out to you every single day. And so it was just a reassurance from the Lord. It was encouragement. What, what are, what, what's a, a, like a prophetic word or a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom? What, it's to edify the body, not to be weird. 
And so, again, it wasn't like this miraculous moment. It was just the Lord saying, I see you. I know you. I got you. Amen. Trust me. Keep walking with me. Move forward. So, so, so I'm just saying, like, the gifts of the Spirit are, 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 are used for the common good. They're used to encourage and to edify the body, to exhort, to correct, to across the board. And we're going to talk about that down the road. But it's important to understand that you, don't get, you and I don't get to choose our gifts. All of these are works. So Romans chapter 12 Paul is speaking about the gifts of the Spirit, and he says, all of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So the Spirit of God sovereignly decides the part that we play. That's why a comparison trap is so dangerous. When you're looking like, I want to do that. How come I don't have that? Well, there may not be a grace on your life for that. And, and we, don't, we don't get to pick and choose. It's not like a, a spiritual buffet. Like, man, I think I want healing today. Let me, um, word of knowledge, right? It's like, that's not, that's not how it works. No, the Spirit of God sovereignly selects, and they are supernatural in nature. And so the early church, the first century church, operated and, and utilized the gifts of the Spirit, and they were vital. And I believe the same thing is important for us today that it's vital to the mission that we understand that the gifts are to be desired. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 that you should eagerly desire the gifts, but don't neglect love, which is huge because you can have all the gifts, but if you don't have love, right? And so, so Paul is encouraging us that, man, these are to be desired. These are to be practiced. They're to be done in an orderly way. Paul doesn't tell the Corinthian church, hey, you're all messed up. Stop it. Gifts are not good for you. No, he just says you guys are out of order. So there's an order to things. God is a God of order. So in light of all of that, I think it's important that as we talk about gifts, we have to, talk, we have to look at Jesus first as our model. So we looked last week in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And so what Paul is describing here, this is a beautiful passage, and it really speaks to the entirety of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension in this passage of Philippians. But in order to really kind of understand this, what does it mean for him to empty himself in that way? Like Jesus is fully God. He didn't stop being God. Jesus was fully God, fully man. Let's make that really, really clear. If you miss one of those, you get a distorted picture of Christ. But, but what did it mean for him to, uh, to empty himself of, of that divine right, to humble himself as a servant? I, I love, as we look here in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. So let, let's, let's look at this for a minute. We looked at this last week, but I added a, another verse here. It says, and he was, as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Right? Holy Spirit present. And, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now, we talked last week about how we as a church believe in the Trinity, the eternal Godhead, God in three persons. And this is one of the passages where you see that distinctively and very, very clear. You see the presence of the Father, the presence of the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so I, I think the, the beautiful reality of this is that we see that Jesus was subject to the Father. He was submitted to the Father's will. He was always saying that whatever the father wants, that's what I don't do anything unless I see the father doing it. What does that mean? Well, I think as we unpack this, it's going to make a little bit more sense. And so we see that not only was he submitted to the father, but he was also empowered by the spirit. Luke chapter four says it this way. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness Jesus returned, and then let me just stop there for a moment, and then we'll get to verse 14. So Mark's gospel says that almost he was pushed by the Holy Spirit, driven by the Spirit. So we have full submission to the Father, empowered, led, and guided by the Spirit. So when you think about Jesus emptying himself, now you're going to see how Jesus is modeling for us how we are to live in submission to the Father's will, empowered and led and guided and directed by the Spirit. Jesus is not only our Lord, he's not only our Savior, he's our model. 
Are you, are you track with me? Um, so verse 14 says, Jesus returned to Galilee, what? In the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Now let me take it a step further. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day Jesus, Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. That same power is the word dunamis, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out in power, or how, as Jesus declared, be clothed with power from on high. It's the same exact word. And so, so he's submitted to the Father. He's guided and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I would even, I would even, in, uh, I think this picture will help us understand it a little bit better. He submitted to the Father, empowered and guided by the Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, the difference between Jesus and you and I is this reality in John chapter 3, verse 34. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God has given him the Spirit without limit. So you figure that the gifting ability on Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, was limitless. Every gift, teaching, miracles, signs, wonders, like uh, uh, healing, all that. But for us, we're not going to have all the gifts individually. And I feel like the Lord almost designed it that way so that we can operate as a body, which now we are called the body of Christ. So let me, let me explain this for a moment is that Jesus has a measureless anointing from the Spirit. So again, operating and healing, not a problem. Miracles, teaching, but you see the presence of the Holy Spirit all throughout these moments. And so as you and I as believers, we have the same Spirit. Um, and the church, God has given gifts of the Spirit. So if Jesus had the Spirit and operated in the gifts of the Spirit, you and I have the Spirit, and the church has the gifts of the Spirit, then all of a sudden, John chapter 14 seems to make more sense. The very, very, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And now this Jesus works includes both his miracles um, and his other activities as far as teaching, including the wholeness of his ministry, evangelism, deeds of mercy and compassion. And now every scholar would not doubt on this passage. People pick one side of this passage to say, oh, well, that just means that because the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out upon all people that we can just reach more people than Jesus because our expanse is going to be larger. But that, that's such a stretch. Every commentary that you will read is like, you got to define what are those works. And, it, and it, whether you're reading the ESV Bible, study Bible, or you're looking at NIV, you're looking at major commentaries, they're all going to say the same thing. It's both divine, these miraculous, but also the other aspects of his ministry, teaching, evangelism, mercy, deeds, etc. So, so now Jesus is our model. And, and I want you to notice something. Jesus, many times when things were just booming, like things are just exploding. People are getting healed. Like, like there's, there's big crowds. Jesus would be like, I'm out. And he would slip away into solitude and silence. And when you look at the context of a lot of those slip aways, he's going to be with the Father. And so, so get this picture. Jesus is going to be with the Father because he says, I don't do anything unless I see the Father doing it. Right? And so Jesus is going to be with the Father. Why? Because, again, he's modeling for us what it's like for you and I to walk with the Father, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so in these times of silence and solitude, going to be with the Father, it's like, man, he's, he's hearing the Father's heart. He's communing with his Father. So there's what, what, is, what is happening. There's, there's intimacy happening. There's direction happening. Because remember, he relinquished his divine rights. Fully submitted to the Father empowered by the Spirit. So in other words, what is he doing? Jesus is practicing spiritual disciplines and practices. Now, Dallas Willard says it this way. He says, my central claim is that we can become like Christ by doing one thing, following him in the overall style of life he chooses for himself. What activities did Jesus practice? Such things as solitude, silence, prayer, simple and sacrificial living, intensive study, meditation on God's word and God's ways and service to others. And so, so I want you to get this picture just for a moment, is that spiritual disciplines is how we walk with God like Jesus. 
This is where we encounter God intimately. This is where um, they, they set up and provide environments for you and I to hear from the Lord. So, so what, what do I mean by that? I mean, like now, like when you go to your time with the Lord, it should be, man, God's word should be present. Because the number one way God is going to speak to you is through his word. And if you don't know his word, it's going to be hard to recognize his voice in moments that the Holy Spirit is leading you. So you want to you, you, you be saturated in the word of God so that you can know and understand the heart of God. Let the Holy Spirit transform and renew your mind. Remember, the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance the things that Jesus had spoken. But we need to study to show ourselves approved. And so, so in your quiet time, man, there should be the, the scripture. There should be communion and prayer. There should be this, this solitude and isolation. So we said this year we're going we're gonna to practice and work on spiritual disciplines, that they're not legalistic or religious if they're moving you closer to the heart of God and transforming your heart that's leading to you engaging and being a light in the world. And so, so Jesus used spiritual disciplines. Uh, spiritual disciplines is how we walk with God like Jesus, but, but ready for this one? Spiritual gifts are how we serve like Jesus. And so it's the guaranteed place of power because they're Holy Spirit given. I'm telling you, I've been preaching long enough. I could get up and I can preach a message. I could probably, for some of you, I could probably make you cry. I know how to ebb and I know how to flow. I've been preaching for 20 years. That part of that is, is just a natural, is a learned skill. It's a learned ability. But can I tell you, apart from the spirit of God, nobody's hearts will be transformed. I'll be up here as a clanging symbol. Sounds great. Amen. Good word. No transformation. So, so, so my heart and my goal and, and our heart for our team here is not that, hey, we preach great messages. No, but the Holy Spirit is present and lives are being transformed as the word of God is being declared. Now, don't get, don't get me wrong. When I'm preaching the word of God, regardless if my motives are right or not, man, God loves you and God loves people. So sometimes you're like, man, how could God use that person? Listen, God's grace sometimes is beyond, but his word never falls or returns void. And so even though the man may be flawed, which we all are, the word of God is not and still accomplishes what it was set out to do. But I want you to catch that heart. Like you can use natural talents and abilities, but that's not guaranteed power. It's not guaranteed power. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is our Lord, but he's also our model. And now you and I, I think this is so beautiful. Now you and I are the hands and feet of Jesus in the earth. Paul says in Romans 12, he says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, these members do not all have the same function, right? Because remember, the gifts that the Spirit gives us, they're sovereign. They're supernatural and they're sovereign. We don't get to pick those. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, with Christ being the head, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Can I just set some of you free today? Listen, run your race. Don't try to run somebody else's race. Like your race is valuable. Otherwise, it's like saying, hey, God, you made a mistake and the gifts that you've given me are not important. I tell you what, man, you lose that pinky toe, you try to balance. You don't know what you don't have until you lose it. But you can see this. You know, I, I hear this all the time, and it's true, and it's also a partial truth. I don't need to be in church to be a Christian. Facts. You do not need to be in this building to be a Christian. But if you are a Christian, and you're a part of the body, yet never gathering with the body, how does this make sense? Because you're part of the body. We belong to one another. So let, let, me, let me tell you this. It's not dependence, and it's not independence. It's interdependence. Us as one body being the hands and feet of Jesus in there. So let me just ask you this. Do you really want to see, because I know I do, I want to see God's will be done. I want to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I want to see darkness pushed back. I want to see lives saved. I want to see hearts, homes, and cities revived. 
I want us to make an eternal impact as a church. I want us to be able to speak into a post-Christian world and culture with the love and grace of God, but also with the ability to give an answer for the hope that lies within us so that like Stephen, we can be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom as we proclaim the wonders of God that people look back and are like, how are you doing this? Even though as he's declaring that, Stephen is being stoned to death. But I, I want our church to thrive. I don't, want, I don't want to see churches close their doors anymore. But if that's going to happen, we have to decide that we're going to walk by the power of the Spirit, utilizing the gifts of the Spirit that God has given us together as a body, just as Jesus modeled for us. So over the next several weeks, we're going to look at a, a few different breakdowns. We're going to look at love gifts. We're going to look at word gifts, and we're going to look at power gifts. A lot of times we think about gifts, people land here. Power gifts. But it's just because they really haven't studied gifts. There's so many more aspects, about 21 recorded in Scripture. And so we're just going to kind of work through these. And let me tell you why this is so important, because God has called us to take territory this year in both soil, meaning expanding our reach to see people come to know Jesus, but also in our soul. God has designed you specifically and intricately as a part of this body here. And I, I promise you this, we're not, I'm not talking about anything weird. I'm talking about you fulfilling and living out your God-given purpose. Because I'm telling you I, I don't, are you, are you, I don't know if you're living in the same space that I am, but as I'm, I've had so many conversations this week. There are so many people in distress right now. And I can tell you what, man, I, I do my best to encourage and to exhort and to, but we are living in a time, man, we need the power of God with the truth of God combined that we might see revival in our soul and in our soil. So let me just ask you a couple quick questions before we leave. Do you know what your gifts are? Do you understand how your gifts work? This is a big one. Do you have people like speaking out in tongues in church? That's not how it's supposed to work. You know, I, 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 want, I want to encourage you. Some of you guys are a little bit nervous in regards to this stuff. I stopped an entire youth camp because it got weird. And it was an elder that was leading it. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. We're at a youth camp. And... Next thing you know, it was like having kids lay down, and it was just, it just was weird. Youth pastors were praying protection over their kids, like, protect them, like, what is happening? And as a man that I respect, and I still respect to this day, but I had to shut it down. And I went up to the platform, and I just said, we're stopping this right now. The Holy Spirit is not in this. That was the hardest thing, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in ministry. But I just knew it was completely out of order to the word of God. And I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit can't do things that aren't just specifically written in the text. But I know when it's not Jesus and when it's not the Holy Spirit. And I did it with grace. Never rebuke an older man harshly. I did it with grace. But, man, we, we shut down that service. My supervisor came up to me at the time and said, because he wasn't there, he said, hey, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you did today. I was like, man, I didn't mean any harm. I just, it was going in a, a weird direction. He's like, no, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you for, for doing that. And so I just want you to know I'm super sensitive to that stuff. But that doesn't mean that all of a sudden because of that experience, it's like, oh, psh, gifts of the Spirit, no way. Like, no, that's, we don't rationalize anything else like that. And Paul didn't do that in the text. He said, you guys are out of order. Let's get things back in line. But you still desperately, you still definitely need to have the gifts as a part of the body. But you got to understand how they work. Are you actively using your gifts? Are you running from your gifts? Just some questions to bring before the Holy Spirit this week. Bring before the Lord and just say, Lord, where am I at here? Because God has gifted you as a follower of Jesus. 
The first and greatest gift, though, is the Holy Spirit upon salvation. That's the greatest gift of all time, is the gift of salvation and the Spirit of God coming in to dwell on the inside of you and transform you. So if you're not walking with Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with God, that's the first step, is to surrender your life to him. Have him fill you with his spirit. The Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of Christ. Fill your hearts and mind. Bring transformation to your heart. Outside of that, you have people in the Bible like, we're like, hey, uh, we want to try to do that stuff. In the book of Acts, they try to, the seven sons of Sceva tried to cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demonic entity looked at them and said, uh, yeah, Jesus I know, Paul I've heard of, but who are you? So they stripped them down naked, beat them up, and ran them out of the house. So it's not like you, Simon the sorcerer, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. You can't just add the Holy Spirit to your little bag of tricks. No, it's life in the Spirit with doing life with the Holy Spirit. And so if that's you today, maybe you need to return. Maybe you've been away from the Lord. And it's just time to come home. You sense the spirit of God drawing you back. You've sensed it for a long time. Maybe to a deeper place of surrender. Saying, God, I just need to, I need to lay down everything. I want to pray with you right now before we, we close. Father, in Jesus' name, whether it's here in person or online, I just ask, God, that you would come, Holy Spirit. You're so gracious with us. You're so patient with us. I just pray, God, that if there's some that don't know you today, maybe they have a religious understanding of you, but they really don't know you. But I pray that today would be the day. If that's you, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer, but I'm hoping it will just communicate what the Lord is doing in your heart. You can put it in your own words if you want. It's not even the prayer that saves you. It's that if you confess and believe, that Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he was who he says he was, that he lived, he died, that he rose from the dead, that he is the son of God. So this prayer is just to kind of help guide you, but that's, that's the reality of it. You don't have to pray this prayer with me to be saved. It's just hoping to, to lead you in that confession. And it would just go something like this. You can pray this with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, today I surrender. Lord, forgive me for my sin. But I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for me. You took my payment, my penalty, you took my sin. And on the third day you rose, which is proof that you are who you say you were. That means my sins can be forgiven and my heart can be restored and my mind. So Lord, I surrender to you and I turn from my sin, turn from my ways and I turn to you. Fill me with your spirit. Transform my heart and mind. Give me a hunger for your word and a desire for you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Can we give the Lord a big hand today?